evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight we've got some creepy porn lawyer news to lead the show. In an amazing twist tonight, Stormy Daniels' lawyer may have to cut a check to President Trump, a check that we suspect would bounce. We'll have details for you in just a minute. But first, Focahontas is on the warpath this evening. For decades, as you know, the senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, has claimed to be an American Indian. Now, she did this to advance her career, and it worked. Harvard Law School once boasted that Warren was the first woman of color to ever serve on their faculty. Woman of color. But Warren also used her fake Indian heritage to frame herself as somebody affected by America's sad history of racial discrimination. Warren posed as a victim because on the left, victimhood is power. Watch her do it. My father's parents said, absolutely not. You can't marry her because she's part Cherokee and she's part Delaware. And um, after fighting it as long as they could, my parents went off. They eloped. So what I know about my parents is I know that in that little town they grew up in, that my father's parents knew enough about my mother and her family. Assume then that that's the, the fact, that you're one thirty second. No, that doesn't tell you. Don't do that. Well, why, why shouldn't I do that? But that is the fact, no, is it not? No, it is not. Why not? It's not about the number. Her own trail of tears. Well, as it turned out, old Liawatha couldn't come up with a single, not one, American Indian in her family tree. The rest of the country laughed at her, and rightly so. And then this morning, Warren hit back at the rest of us. Out of nowhere, she produced a private DNA test that she claims confirms her story. Along with it, of course, she released a video that doubles as an ad for her presidential campaign. Here it is. Now, the president likes to call my mom a liar. What do the facts say? The facts suggest that you could absolutely have a Native American ancestor in your pedigree. I'm not enrolled in a tribe, and only tribes determine tribal citizenship. I understand and respect that distinction, but my family history is my family history. <laughs> well, so the senator concedes that she's not, quote, enrolled in a tribe. You may have guessed that. That fact is settled in any case. But what do the test results that she's produced actually say? Well, according to Warren, she may have had one unnamed and still unidentified Indian ancestor, not necessarily from North America, by the way, eight or so generations ago, potentially. Now, that could make her less than one one-thousandth American Indian. That's about roughly as American Indian as virtually every white person you've ever met, which is to say, not American Indian at all. So don't count on running into Elizabeth Warren at the next meeting of the tribes. But do count on her to keep pretending that she's somehow the spokeswoman for indigenous peoples everywhere. Warren has appointed herself head of the hashtag Me Sue movement. Native communities have faced discrimination, neglect, and violence for generations. And Trump can say whatever he wants about me. But mocking Native Americans or any group in order to try to get at me, that's not what America stands for. Now, wait, hold on a minute. Who's mocking Native Americans? Well, if anyone's doing that, it's Elizabeth Warren. She's the one who's stolen their identity and leveraged their suffering to climb the greasy pole of our fake meritocracy. No High Plains whiskey trader ever acted with more ruthless cynicism than she has. And actual Indians are disgusted by it. The Cherokee Nation just this afternoon released a statement. They called Warren's claims inappropriate and wrong. Quote, it makes a mockery out of DNA test and its legitimate uses, while also dishonoring legitimate tribal governments and their citizens. In other words, it's bad for Indians. So it looks like that backfired. But DNA tests aren't really the point, and we should remember that. It doesn't matter if Fekajuia is 1% Indian or 90% Indian. DNA should never matter, except to physicians treating inherited illnesses. Your bloodline should not dictate who you vote for, what job you get, where your kids go to school, whether you get promoted, or anything else. A ruling class sends the opposite message. They believe in a racial spoil system. They tell you that your immutable traits, the ones that you had absolutely nothing to do with, are the most important thing about you. That is the very definition of racism. It's also a dangerous course for a country to take, especially right now. Increasingly, researchers know much more about DNA and the role that it plays in human life. 
It's not hard at all to imagine a society that degenerates into pure genetic determinism, with factions squabbling for entitlements based on their genes. That's already happening in Brazil, where race tribunals measure people's skull shapes to see if they qualify for affirmative action. Other countries throughout history, as you may have read, have done similar and horrifying things. Do you want to live in a place like that? No, thanks. Better to stick to our ideals, where we do our best, not always successfully, but we try to treat people as individuals and judge them by their behavior, what they do, and not their ancestry. Under that system, Fraudazuma never would have bothered to make up a fake family tree. It would have been pointless. Harvard likely would have hired someone impressive in her place. Multiply that by every institution in America, and you'd have a better country. Now, Elizabeth Warren's video today included ample footage of news personalities ridiculing her claims about her heritage. Here it is. What does Warren translate into Cherokee as? Spreading bull? <laughs> you know Elizabeth Warren, right? Most people. <laughs> Radio host Howie Carr was making war whoops in that clip, and he joins us tonight to make more. Howie, it's great to see you. So what do you make? I mean, you must feel a little chastened now that it turns out she's one, potentially one one thousandth American Indian. Are you retracting your mockery? No, no. Uh, Tucker, if, uh, if the, the Boston Globe was a legitimate news organization, the headline <laughs> yes. on the story would be something like uh, DNA test prove white woman, white woman. Or, uh, you know, DNA test confirmed Senator Warren is still a fake Indian. I mean, this is ridiculous. The, the, all my life, uh, uh, Tucker, the, the Globe has been running a story every sixth year saying uh, uh, Senator Kennedy is turning his life around. Well, Senator Kennedy's gone, so now Elizabeth Warren is turning her life around, you know, and they're, they're trying to promote her. Last month, they, last month they had a, uh, an amazing story about how uh, her uh, uh, ethnic fraud, uh, claiming they'd been American Indian, did not affect her uh, meteoric rise in uh, academia after she started checking the box. That didn't work. So now, so now they're back with this, uh, this today. No, let me just ask way, you, Tucker, I mean, as the only person really outside New England who ever looks at the Boston Globe, I always wonder, are they taking payment directly from her, or is it just a kind of moral payment that they get. Why, why are they carrying water for a U.S. senator over there? Well, I think, it, you know, she's she's part of the resistance. And the, the what was interesting to me is uh, this morning when the story came out, it said, well, she's she's somewhere between 132nd and 1512th, which is not that great, but that was all wrong. They, you know, they're used to fake news, but this time it was fake math, and it was really only 164th or up to 1,024. Uh, as soon as I leave here tonight, I'm playing the lottery. My number is uh, 1024 tonight. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, all the moon bats who love her, they've all posted the story saying she's 132nd and this proves it. They didn't run the corrections. They had to run two corrections on the story. It was so the fuzzy math uh, until uh, mid-afternoon. So, they, you know, it, they're, they're carrying water for her. Has anyone ever asked the obvious question, which is, who cares? I mean, if she has one genetic makeup, does that make her a better person than if she has another genetic makeup? I mean, do we live in that country where you're judged by your DNA? Tucker, I've been asking her, I've been offering to pay for her DNA test for many moons, you know. I offered to come up with my own wampum to pay for it. But she, she refuses. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's, you know, kind of some kind of, she's playing on the white guilt. And, and, you know, I just wanted to mention this too, Tucker, you know, another fraud that she's involved in, Pow Wow Chow. You're familiar with this cookbook? <laughs> yes, we this are. is the one that she... This yes. is the cookbook that she contributed to uh, all Indian recipes, and I think a uh, chef prepared some for you. One of them is cold crab omelets, with uh, uh, you know, very popular on the on the t trail of tears back in the 19th century. Cold well, crab. Actually, it was actually it was lifted from a New York Times cookbook by a French chef. <laughs> We're actually recreating that recipe later on the show. Howie Carr, <laughs> really the best thing about New England, joining us tonight. Thank you, Howie. Great to see you. Thank you, Tucker. Bill Jacobson has followed this story more closely and for longer than maybe anyone else. He's a professor at Cornell Law School. He blogs at Legal Insurrection, which you should read, and he joins us tonight. Um, Bill, does this settle the story that you've been covering, low these many years? 
No, it doesn't settle anything at all. In fact, it raises more questions. I mean, your viewers need to understand how deceptive Elizabeth Warren was in claiming Native American heritage, Native American ancestry. She did not claim it when she was a child. She didn't claim it for college. She didn't claim it for law school. She only claimed it when she was in her late 30s and beginning to climb the law school ladder, the law professor ladder from the University of Texas to Harvard. That's the only time Time she's ever claimed it. She never affiliated with Native Americans. She never helped Native Americans. She was never a faculty advisor for Native Americans. She got herself listed as Native American so she could be declared a minority law professor. Uh, and she did that when she was climbing the ladder. And we know why she did that. She can say whatever she wants, but everybody understands. This is a woman who built her political narrative claiming that other people are rigging the system. She tried to rig her career by yes. claiming a status to which she's not entitled. But wait a second. The Boston Globe told me a little while back that claiming to be the first non-white female Harvard Law School professor had no effect at all on her ascent within Harvard Law School. She didn't get any benefit from that. Is that true? Well, we don't know that because Harvard has never released her complete hiring file. What the oh. Boston Globe had were, le were documents Elizabeth Warren provided to her, documents a few other people provided to, to them. But to my knowledge, and I specifically asked their reporter this question and never got an answer, her complete hiring file was never released. So, yes, there's, there may be nothing there, but does it really matter whether she benefited? She tried to benefit. Benefit. She tried to get an advantage over other people by claiming a status to which she's not entitled. It's the worst form of cultural appropriation or misappropriation, which is a very hot topic in progressive circles. She tried to misappropriate the identity of one of the most victimized people in, in history, or at least in recent history, which is Native Americans. And That's progressives seem not to care. And yet, without conclusive evidence, her lackeys in the press declared her innocent. Amazing. Professor, thank you very much for that. I appreciate thank it. Thanks you. for following that story. Up next, we have some major breaking creepy porn lawyer news. It almost pains us to bring it to you, but this time it's worth it. Stay tuned for that. Well, normally we'd call this a Fox News alert, but tonight we want to be a little more direct. It's really a creepy porn lawyer alert. A federal judge has dismissed a defamation lawsuit that Stormy Daniels filed against President Trump. Not only that, the judge says that Trump is entitled to receive attorney's fees. That means, of course, that the creepy porn lawyer may have to cut the president, his self-described nemesis, a check. But I'll get your hopes up too far. The check would probably bounce. The creepy porn lawyer may realize that, too. He is vowing to appeal the ruling. We'll continue to follow this case because, honestly, we can't help ourselves. We can't look away. Democrats forecasting a blue wave of voters in November. We'll see. Some of them overtly say that illegal aliens are part of that wave. In the state of Georgia, Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams says the blue wave will include all segments of society, including, quote, those who are documented and undocumented. Illegal immigrants, of course, are not allowed to vote in federal elections. But Democrats increasingly are pushing back against that assumption. Will Juwanda is the Democratic nominee for Montgomery County City Council in the state of Maryland, and he joins us tonight. Will, thanks a lot for coming on. Good to be here. So this seems like a bright red line that you would never want a foreign citizen voting in your election, would you? Yeah, and they're not allowed to. And that's, and that, that's next, not actually what Stacey was saying. I think it's a distraction to talk about that. Her point was the larger point that there's a lot of ways to be civically involved. I often say voting's the end of the civic process. Before that, you ask your congressman for or your city councilman for a sign on your street. You organize, you protest. The Dreamers are a perfect example, not citizens, but they've had tremendous political impact on both sides of the aisle. Why would you want someone who's here legally, who's not supposed to be here, you didn't welcome the person living here in violation of your laws, right. taking services illegally, using a fake federal ID, which 100% of them are. Why would you want that person influencing your political process? Well, dreamers have influenced it no, not greatly. Dreamers. There are 22 million illegals. The same types of people no, you're not talking the same. about. There's here. a special legal designation for dreamers. Fair or not? 
uh, being upheld by a federal judge now. But the overwhelming majority are not dreamers. They're 22 million illegals. That's the federal term for them. Why would you want them influencing anything about your country? Well, if you live here, well, first of all, undocumented, I'd like to call them undocumented individuals, they pay over $20 billion in federal taxes but receive no benefit. Well, that's, of course, no not, that's, security, that's no Medicare, not, no not true and they at shouldn't. all. And actually, they, they receive billions in, in Medicare, they're, they're in Medicaid. And, of course, the overwhelming majority of the births that they have in this country are paid for by you and me, legal citizens. So they take a lot. We educate their kids. They use our infrastructure. But the question is more a theoretical one. Why, if someone is breaking your law, would that person have a right to influence is a f citizen of a foreign country, like the Russian hackers who hacked our... No, I'm serious. It's a foreigner who's not allowed to be here. Why would that Everyone person Everyone arrived influence? here at some point, even your ancestors, Le right? And when they got here, they got engaged in the, in the civic life of their community. They went down and figured out how to figure out how to have their community be safe, how to get a driver's license, how to apply for no, but school. The, the legally, for sure. I'm not making an argument against yeah. immigration at all. I'm just saying... But, and again, they're not voting. But is there a... Dis she wasn't no, but saying you're saying that they, that they should, should have an influence on our election. They already do. It's a fact. But why would, why would we want because that? Because anyone that be lives here in the county that. is contributing to... in the country that's contributing to our democracy has so a right so to be heard. So what is citizenship? Mean? That gives you a right to vote. They don't have the right to vote, but, but they can sure, participate but they have every in other the right civic crisis. Even if they're human beings. Even if they're here illegally. Even if they're here undocumented illegally, yes, people participate in the civil process. So do President I have Trump a, wait, said that dreamers can participate in the, the civic dreamers process? Dreamers are a tiny. No, they're the same no, thing. No, no, they're not at all the same thing. They are not. Are here, they not undocumented illegally? They're not here illegally yes, because they are. The pre President Obama made them legal temporarily, <laughs> as you know. Right, right. But the 22 million are but here illegally. But before that, they they advocated to get that status, and they, they did not have, have They that shouldn't status. have gotten it. And for political reasons, the former president caved to their demands. My question is, do I have this right to go to a foreign country and demand that they change their the way they, they govern themselves? Well, people do it all the time. Do Americans I, do, are overseas advocating for all sorts of changes in, really? in so repressive if, countries and nations across the world. And you think that's okay? If I show up in a country illegally, I just walk into Mexico and I say, I demand that you make accommodations for me. Do you think there's, that's a little weird or no? Not accommodations. What I'm saying is well, that, that we have an immigration debate in this country that's been going on for a long time. If you go back to President Reagan, he made a lot no, of people no, legal. Okay, but it, all he, that stuff is he, happening. He made a lot of people legal, and it was a huge mistake, I think. I'm not here to well, flack for Republicans. I'm here to determine what the truth is. And if I go to a foreign country and they say, you're not allowed to be here, and I say, shut up, racist, you have to listen to me, I demand you allow me to stay. But Would no you one say, said that here. What do you mean? You're no saying and no one has said that. Are you joking? No, no one we, said that. We run tapes of illegal aliens all the time, burning U.S. flags, carrying Mexican flags, calling anyone who opposes There's plenty of invaded. Americans that burn U.S. flags, too. I, I agree, <laughs> and I'm against it. But right. they're citizens. Me too. It's their country. And it's not. So, do you want to load everyone up and just ship, ship them out? Yeah, a lot, most of them, okay. I think. Well, I mean, if they're the here illegally, too, who, well, no, I who, guess they have a right are, to stay. What's your criteria? Well, the president said that these people have a right to stay. Okay, and a federal judge has upheld that. I disagree, but that's the law. Right. The other law is that people who are not here legally have to leave. They're 22 million. So, if we passed a pathway to citizenship like President Bush wanted to do, and we got, I very, would oppose we got that. Close, but if it were the law, see, I believe in the law. You guys don't. I, I believe in the law as well. Then why wouldn't we deport? everyone here the, illegally. The, the lead into this story was Stacey Abrams is asked saying that illegal uh, immigrants should vote. She didn't say that. And that's what I'm well, saying. No, no, she, no okay, one's saying that. I think she was saying that. But you're saying that illegal aliens have a right to influence our political process. And I'm saying we should be horrified by that prospect. Why wouldn't no, we no, no, be? No. Everyone started here as an illegal immigrant no, or immigrant no, of some true. or of some. Really? Some I'm point. looking at my stage manager who grew yeah. up in another country and came here legally. Well, so did my dad. They came. He came over here. Exactly. Even, exactly. even if you have people coming to this country, when the Irish came off the boats, they weren't necessarily legal. Uh, you know, so people were not. Uh, that's the way this country. Oh, so was we have formed. no right to defend our borders because the oh, Irish. Of course came? we can defend oh, okay. them. Of course we can defend them. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm, I wish we had more time. I think it's an interesting topic. We'll come and back. I appreciate taking time out of your schedule to join us. Only citizens should vote, though. Amen. <laughs> Hillary Clinton at it again, defending her husband after posing as a champion of women. How does that work? We'll find out from Camille Paglia. She was, by the way, Hillary, the leader of our incompetent ruling class, one of the reasons Trump got elected, one of the reasons she's on the cover of a new book called Ship of Fools. You can get a copy almost anywhere. Stay tuned.
Clinton said that Brett Kavanaugh could not be allowed on the Supreme Court. We had to believe his accuser, she said, even without evidence. But Clinton turns out to be one of the most self-aware politicians in this country. That's a high bar. So it wasn't too surprising that on Sunday she backtracked from this position. She told CBS that her own husband had no obligation to resign over the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Some today have said he should have stepped down. In retrospect, do you think Bill should have resigned in the wake of the Monica Lewinsky scandal? Absolutely not. It wasn't an abuse of power? No, no. There are people who look at the incidents of the 90s and they say a president of the United States cannot have a consensual relationship with an intern. The power imbalance is too great. He was great. an adult. But let me ask you this. Where's the investigation of the current incumbent? Well, even the ladies of The View are not buying this line of argument. Instead, they ripped Hillary Clinton, believe it or not, for her evasive interview tactics. Here's a selection. What she just did is exactly what the Republicans do. Right. They change the subject. So that's why we never get anywhere in the discourse. Mm -hmm. so, you, you know you have a bad argument when your immediate response is, well, they were worse. Call it out for being wrong and for being bad for all those years. I just don't think she can have a bit both ways. Nina Perlman yeah. claims that Hillary yeah. tried to intimidate her into silence. Kathleen Wiley claims that Clinton's tried to intimidate her into not telling the truth. She called Mon Monica Lewinsky a narcissistic looney tune. Jennifer Flowers, some failed cabaret singer. Democrats have got to move on yeah. from the Clintons. Camille Polly is an author, one of the country's best-known cultural critics. She has written extensively about Hillary Clinton for more than 20 years, among many other topics. Her latest book is titled Provocations, and Camille Polly joins us today. We're honored to have you. Thank you very much for coming on. So, Thank you, Tucker. Yeah, Hillary Clinton is mentioned actually quite a bit in this book. Um, yes. Before I ask you broader questions about what's happening in this country, what's your reaction to her role in the, the kind of Me Too movement of right now? Well, it's very ambiguous. I, I don't. I think that her, her, her history has been hypocritical. I was the only Democrat uh, feminist to call for Bill Clinton's resignation, and I had voted for him twice, and, and don't regret it. But it was a scandal. The, the, the squalor that he introduced into the people's house. This, all this was happening. The servicing of him by by an intern in the White House offices. Yes. No, it's it's a very good point and a good reminder. So what as you as someone who's written about sex and gender roles and our society for so long, for many decades, what do you make of the convulsion we're going through, particularly of the Me Too movement? Well, I, it's uh, it's great that attention is being paid to uh, the women's be women being abused. I, in 1986, I was lobbying for moderate sexual harassment guidelines at my university in Philadelphia, but uh, I think we've gone a bit too far here. I think that you know fun fundamental uh, civil rights involving the presumption of, of innocence okay, have to be considered. So what I'm, I what I espouse as a feminist is that women themselves must take charge of their own interactions okay, with men. They must signal at the time that something is unacceptable. This waiting 10 years, 20 years, 30 years uh, is, uh, this is not, a, not only not American, it's Stalinist. But women, we're told again and again by people who claim to empower women, are themselves powerless and can't. They can't say anything because they're so Absolute nonsense. lacking in power. Nonsense. Okay. Okay. No, that, working class women, yes, may be so dependent upon a job that they cannot protest. But there, as I have written, there is no excuse for well-educated, upper-middle class professional women to let offenses to their dignity okay, go by. Okay, you must draw the line when it happens. It's absurd that you feel too powerless, uh, you can't complain. These people, women who, who say that, are simply putting the career advantage over the larger question. Of, of feminist issues and the protection of women. You've written so much about, I mean, just to be blunt, about sex for all these years. What do you make of seeing your, I guess, former allies on the left strike an almost evangelical or Puritan position on these questions, a kind of blue nose outrage at sensual pleasure, at personal happiness, telling you that, you know, you're not allowed to do this or do that. I mean, what do you make of this? 
Well, there has been a split within feminism since second wave feminism was born in the late 1960s. The media has, have been extremely lazy in not pursuing this. Uh -huh, I yes. belong to the pro-sex, pro-pop culture wing of feminism. I, I favor the legalization of prostitution. I have defended pornography. I admire strip clubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's, there has been this argument for a very long time. Uh, my my branch won in the 90s thanks to Madonna suddenly bursting on the scene. But the Madonna has faded and lost all sense of her own trajectory. And I am astonished after the victory of the pro-sex wing that we're back to feminist puritanism again of the Andrea Dworkin kind. We're talking about mental imbalance. We're talking about hysteria that has nothing whatever to do with women's rights. These are neurotics okay, who, are, who, who, who are talking about hatred of men, who are poisoning the culture, making it more difficult yeah. for young women to reconcile with young men. You may not agree with Kamal, Kamal Polly if you're watching the show, but trust me, one of the more interesting people out there, an engaging writer, and this is her new book, Provocations, and they do indeed provoke. Kamal Polly, it's great to see you tonight. Thank you for that. Thank you, Tucker. Party leaders won't admit it, but Democrats are laying the groundwork for impeaching the president should they take the majority in the House next month. Is that wise? That's next. Well, leaders of the Democratic Party are trying very hard not to talk about it in public, but Democrats are, as a factual matter, on track to impeach the president if they retake the Congress in November, if they retake the House, which looks likely, to be honest. And they have no choice in that. The Democratic base is so amped up, hating Trump is the one thing that holds them together, that the vast majority of them think the president should be impeached. For what doesn't matter? Being a bad guy. In November, if they take the House, they probably will have no choice but to go for impeachment, whether they have a good reason for it or not. Everybody knows this. Richard Goodstein is an attorney and former advisor to Hillary Clinton, and he joins us tonight. Now, Richard, let me just say, I'm pretty sure you're against impeachment, okay, because you, you were here for the whole Clinton impeachment. You saw how it hurt the Republicans. You don't like Trump, but you also know there's no actual high crime or misdemeanor for which you could impeach him. It's insane. But you also know your base, and you know they're, they are insane. So how is the Democratic Party going to keep from being driven by its own lunatic voters if they take the House? Well, just for the record, I actually think uh, it's not just high crimes and misdemeanors. It's treason, bribery, high crime. I, I actually think that the, oh. the universe of things that we could go after. But let's have that So for having day. a press conference with Vladimir Putin could get you impeached. I, I think if he knew about the fact that close family members were, co were consorting with the Russians during the campaign, yeah. Consorting that is. But again, with the Russians. That's, a, that, that's another discussion. Okay. The fact of the matter is the Democrats, the Democratic leaders are pushing off discussion of impeachment because they're going to win on health care and on the issue of do you contain Trump or you gen do you enable him? And I think most people want to contain him. Look, the fact is in 2014, most Republicans wanted to impeach Obama. And that didn't cause the Republican leaders to go after impeaching him then. Oh, I remember that. That's when they were surrounding Democratic lawmakers in restaurants and pounding on the front doors of the Supreme Court and screaming like wild animals and shooting people with bear spray in the streets of Portland where the Republicans were doing... Yeah, it's all coming back to me. I mean, come on. There's no comparison between the lunacy on display on the left, it's a threat to you, as you know, and what the Republicans are up to. Like, they can't control those people. They're not controlling them yeah. now. I would say there's no comparison to locking up babies in cages with anything that Barack Obama did. That's babies what infuriated people to surround people in restaurants. Look, here's what the Democrats are going what to are do you if you really about? want to know. Babies are uh, being put in cages? Uh, on the Mexican border. But again, another discussion. I think what's going to happen <laughs> is there are going to be public okay. hearings, public uh -huh. hearings like Watergate on the Russian attack, on the emoluments, on... Uh, obstruction of justice on tax fraud, money laundering, bank fraud, oh, on a series of things. I don't think they're going to be going after impeachment because I think politically they realize they couldn't clear the Senate and they frankly rather have a weakened Trump to run against than. Wait, so can I uh, ask you a, a sincere a question? Pen. Do you really think after two years of talking about Russia, when Russia poses no actual threat to us, the threat is China and Google. I mean, there are real threats. Russia's not in the running. You really think they're going to have hearings on Russia? You think that helps them to talk more about Russia? And Vladimir Putin 
and treason. I mean, honestly, you think they would do that? That's so nuts. Uh, I think Trump appointed officials at the top of our intelligence community. You've heard about this Pompeo fellow. Remember, he used to be head of the CIA. He said that the Russians attacked the United States and posed a threat to us. I don't care what Pompeo the, says. Do you really think that we need more hearings on Russia? Russia? Uh, Honestly? I absolutely think. Are there are a lot of voters who want all that? These people that. I think all these people that testified behind closed doors in the House and even the Senate should like the Watergate hearings. That's what the public's going to know what really happened. And I think the Mueller report frankly, will lack that. It will lack kind of the face and the immediacy of what the public hearings would do. So, yes. So I you're saying the Mueller, an independent investigation that extends beyond two years is not enough. We need more hearings about Russia. You really? And well, you think the public's going to say, thank heaven we elected the Democrats. I want to hear more about Russia. I, you really I think would be so? more sensitive to that chart. I would be more sensitive to the charge about how long Mueller's going on. If there was a single Republican that complained when Ken Starr went beyond year two, three, four, et cetera. So, yes, I actually think the public is deserved, is owed a, yeah. he, a public hearing and showing more about Russia. what happened. I don't think they're, they're not, they haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> I know out there, throughout the Fruited Plains, people are grateful that we're going to keep talking about Russia. <laughs> you got it. Into, okay. into the next millennium. Richard, thank you let's, very let's much. Let's talk the day after the Mueller report comes out. How's that? Russia! Well, in other foreign news, Saudi Arabia's government is accused of murdering a journalist and critic. Now they may say it was an accident. Mark Stein weighs in on that next. Also, Washington permanent class needs to impeach Trump because they can't acknowledge that he was legitimately elected. If they did, then it would expose how badly they have run the country for the past three decades. It is detailed in a new book that you can buy wherever books are sold. It's on the screen. As of right now, the governor of Saudi Arabia is denying any involvement in the disappearance and the likely murder of the Washington Post columnist who disappeared after entering a Saudi consulate in Turkey to get a document. We don't know what happened to him, they're saying. But tonight, the Saudis reportedly are considering admitting that the journalist was, in fact, killed. Trace Gallagher has more on this developing story. Hey, Trace. Hey, Tucker. In fact, there are now multiple reports the Saudi government is putting together an explanation to acknowledge that Jamal Khashoggi was killed during an interrogation that went wrong and that the real intent was to abduct Khashoggi and bring him back to Saudi Arabia. The goal for this new narrative is to absolve Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of responsibility by giving him plausible deniability. In other words, saying the Crown Prince didn't order the killing. But analysts point out for the past two weeks, Saudi Arabia has denied having anything to do with Khashoggi's disappearance, even when there was video of Khashoggi entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, but then never leaving. Turkish authorities also reportedly have audio and video evidence that Khashoggi was killed inside the consulate, though that information has not been released. And then there's the matter of two Saudi planes arriving in Turkey the day Khashoggi disappeared, carrying 15 members of what many have described as a hit team. Those men were waiting at the consulate for Khashoggi's arrival, and Turkish investigators believe they killed him, dismembered him, and took his body away. President Trump said a short time ago he is aware of reports that Saudi Arabia may claim Khashoggi's death was unintended, though Mr. Trump could not confirm that statement. Tucker. Trace Gallagher, thanks for that update. <clears throat> Here to bring us more is Mark Stein. So, Mark, it's hard, call me naive, but it's hard for me to believe that a primitive desert theocracy that beheads its critics in public squares would hurt one of its critics who works at the Washington Post. Were you shocked by the story? Well, I think you may be doing them a, a bit of a disservice there, Tucker. I mean, according to the Turks, they actually flew in an expert in bone sawing just before uh, this man entered the consulate, and uh, as the... Uh, uh, Saudis are now preparing to say was accidentally questioned to death. Uh, awfully sorry, it could happen to anybody. You could wander into the Swedish consulate, it might happen to you. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, the, the, only, the only mystery here 
is why if the Turks, who, who claim to have uh, basically seen all this stuff going on in the hours beforehand, why they haven't actually released it. And there is actually a kind of Turkish-Saudi feud uh, that this particular reporter was very much on the Turkish side of. But other than that, uh, you know, you're right. This is one of the most bloodthirsty regimes on Earth. It's basically ISIS with diplomatic uh, recognition. The only entertainment in Riyadh uh, on a Friday is, are the beheadings in Chop Chop Square. And uh, regardless of liberalization and all the rest of it, this is how they deal with their perceived enemies. So I'm confused, though, about the media coverage of this. And by the way, I, I think American journalists have a right to be upset that a guy who wrote for the Post was apparently dismembered in a, Turk, in a Saudi consulate. But the Saudis also may have had, and there's evidence that they did, advanced knowledge of 9-11. And they funded madrasas across the Islamic world that have dramatically increased the incidence of terrorism. No one ever says that. But they're very upset no. about this. Are we missing a larger story here, maybe? Yes, I, I think so. This particular reporter, in fact, uh, before he became, uh, before he uh, uh, arrived in America, he was very close to Prince Turkey, who was the right. Saudi intelligence chief and later the ambassador in London and Washington. Uh, my connection to Prince Turkey is that he once said, the arrogance of Mark Stein knows no bounds, <laughs> uh, which I like so much, I, I had it put as the endorsement on the front cover of my next book. But you mentioned 9-11. Prince Turkey stepped down as Saudi intelligence chief 10 days before 9-11. Uh, this guy, Khashoggi, who's the nephew of the biggest and most celebrated Saudi arms dealer of his generation, uh, this guy, Khashoggi, before he fell out with the Saudi royal family, was Prince Turkey's biggest buddy. There, this is one of those, uh, you know, there are no real, he doesn't deserve well, exactly. to be chopped up in a consulate, but there are no good guys in this story. That is such a good point. So quickly, with all the news today about Elizabeth Warren and her American Indian heritage, which rounds out to about zero percent, we want to recall the time that we prepared one of the traditional recipes that Warren submitted to the right. cookbook, Pow Wow Chow, very quickly from our archives. This is not a DNA test. It's not 23 and Me. We're not getting to the to the and truth it's a cold of this necessarily. Omelet, which is again, but is very it interesting redolent idea. of Native American culture? And I'm about to tell you, and I can sure. eat this. Yes, yes, okay, you can. Everything that. is good to go. Yes, definitely. Mm. You know, you let me know. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't dabble too much with Native American mm -hmm. cooking, but I wouldn't. This is not what what would come to mind immediately. But again, I'm not an expert. <laughs> But it's good. If this is traditional Cherokee food. Sign me. I can see why Elizabeth Warren would pretend to be a member of this tribe. Ah. They cook like that. <laughs> the full Focahontas cooking experience with recipe available online on our Facebook page. Take a look after the show. So, Mark, really quick, were you won over by her DNA test? Oh, yeah, this is a no doubt traditional Oklahoma Cherokee crab recipe. It's in the state song. Oklahoma, where the crab comes sweeping down the plain. Uh, it, is in, it, it is, in fact, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's favorite recipe from a Manhattan restaurant. And I love that about I There's a displaced Cherokee with an authentic Cherokee recipe who didn't get in because, according to Elizabeth Warren, the House of Windsor, a one of the five tribes in her world. That's that's where affirmative action. Uh, the, that's where affirmative action leads, folks. The first Native American head of state in America was King George the Third. If only we'd known. Nobody beats Mark Stein. That's always the lesson when you come on. Mark Stein, thank you. Great to see you. Thanks a lot, Tucker. Elizabeth Warren's made-up Cherokee heritage uh, helped her a lot at Harvard. Meanwhile, Asians are hurt by the discriminatory policies of that school. We'll talk about the lawsuit underway right now against Harvard. Stay tuned. Harvard University going on trial right now for discrimination, racial discrimination. One group is suing the school saying that it systematically penalizes Asian applicants based on their race. And there's a whole lot of data to believe that is absolutely right. B.J. Ingham is the author of Almost Black, How I Got Into Medical School by Pretending That I'm Black, and he joins us tonight. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. So we've been laughing about this Elizabeth Warren story because of it, it's obviously ludicrous. But the fact is she was helped, it seems clear, by claiming to be one race. Many others are hurt by this system, though, which is not quite as funny. Tell us your reaction to what you've seen at Harvard. 
Well, uh, you know, the scam that Harvard has pulled by hiding their racial discrimination beats posing as black to get into medical school any yes. day. Okay, Harvard has used diversity as a justification for racial discrimination against Asian Americans and white people. Uh, they reduced Asian American enrollment in their class from 43% to 18% using discrimination. And in fact, their own internal committee found evidence of discrimination, and of course, they buried the report. Uh, Edward Bloom, I spoke at a rally uh, with Edward Bloom and Students for Fair Admission of the Asian American Coalition for Education recently, and all of this was caught to light because of them. Uh, we can see the racism, plain and simple, in front of our eyes. But I'm confused. So why is this not one of the biggest stories in the country? The most famous university in the world, the oldest in America, the most prestigious, has been caught red-handed discriminating on the basis of race. They're not even defending themselves, and nobody covers it? Why? Uh, I, I can't speak for, for, the, for the motivations of the media, uh, but what I can say is that people, it's so hidden, they bury it in such a way that only a professional admissions consultant like myself could understand how complicated it is, their discrimination. It's plain and simple racism, but it's so carefully hidden behind words like personality trait and that. What is it? It's racism. It's yes. carefully hidden, but it's racism. We only have, unfortunately, like 30 seconds left, but, I mean, you've said this. You're one of the bravest people I've seen well, on this I, topic. I, I, have I you taken say, a lot of guff something. for this? I've taken a lot of guff, but I wanted to thank President Trump. He has been our greatest ally in our fight against racial discrimination. We have a conservative majority, an anti-affirmative action majority in the Supreme Court because of him. Because of President Trump, our issues are being brought before universities like this. You know, you'd think His that liberals is... would be on your side because supposedly they were against it too, but they're not, it turns out. Vijay, thank you very much for coming on. I wish we had more time. It was great to see you. Thanks. We're done for the night. We'll be back tomorrow. The show that's a sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. Good night from Washington. Sean Hannity, live from New York City, right now. All right. Talk